I'm Dr. Teresa Lyons, creator of Navigating Autism and Eat to Heal Autism. And this week's Ask Dr. Lyons question is... What does Shank and SCN2A gene mutations do in autism? Autism and genes. It is estimated that about 1,000 genes are involved in autism, which means that no one gene is likely to explain more than 1% of cases. In this video, we'll look at Shank and SCN2A. I had a parent ask me to make a video about Shank, so that's what I'm doing here. And SCN2A is a very recently discovered gene in autism, so I combined the two. If you're curious about other genes or have other types of questions, just ask in the comments below. I read them all. Shank. So let's get involved a little bit in the Shank gene. Mutations or disruptions in the Shank gene family account for about 1% of those with autism. It's no surprise there, because <laughs> for any particular gene, it's going to account for about 1% of those with autism. Shank proteins are involved in different synaptic functions, such as spine morphogenesis, synapse formation, glutamate receptor trafficking, and activity-dependent neuronal signaling. So let's specifically look at Shank 3. Shank 3 is the one that has been involved quite a bit in autism. Shank 3 mutations and duplications are associated with autism, specifically causing defects in synapses maturation and function. Now there is a thinking with genetics. This is old thinking, incorrect thinking, not evolved thinking, but Several years ago, the thinking was that your life and your outcome is dictated by your genes. Now, that's not the case. It's been proven many different times in many different ways, many different therapeutic areas. So I just want to call your attention to a study that has recently been done that showed an increased level of Shank 3 gene methylation also showed that epigenetic dysregulation of Shank 3 may be associated with autism. So here's a quote from that scientific article, and it says, the ability to alter the epigenetic modification and expression of Shank 3 by environmental factors suggests that Shank 3 may be a valuable biomarker for dissecting the role of gene and environment interaction in the etiology of ASD. So what that is saying is that epigenetic modification can change the expression of Shank 3. And epigenetics involves environmental factors. So basically the scientists here are saying, all right, there is a particular gene in Shank 3. And yes, there are mutations and duplications, and that can be correlated with autism. However, that genetic information can be modified by environmental factors such as epigenetics. And epigenetics is all about environmental factors. What are environmental factors? Food is one of the biggest environmental factors. All right, let's look at SCN2A. You know, these gene names sometimes are like, where did they come up with that? So SCN2A, and what that is shortened for is the sodium channel voltage gated type two alpha. So that's where you get SCN2A, sodium channel for SCN2 for the type two, A is from the alpha. Sodium channel voltage gated type two alpha SCN2A gene is located on the positive strand of chromosome 2 between sodium channel gene SCN3A, that makes sense, and the nuclear protein gene CSRNP3. So that's just where SCN2A is located and where they get these names from. SCN2A codes for a neuronal sodium channel and is widely expressed throughout the human central nervous system, but it's not in peripheral tissues. In cortical structures, this sodium channel is co-expressed with another sodium channel, and it's predominantly involved in excitatory glutamatic neurons. 
Now, if you remember from my previous videos explaining genetics and the effects a mutation can have, sometimes when you have a mutation, you have a loss of function. And sometimes when you have a mutation, you have a gain of function. And you might be thinking, well, a gain of function would be good. But here's an example. So in SCN2A, if there is a mutation where you have a loss of function of that sodium channel, it contributes to autism and intellectual disability. Whereas gain of function, so if you have the mutation and there's a gain of function, meaning that sodium channel actually functions better now, that type of mutation contributes to early onset epilepsy. It's not always best to have an increase in function as seen in this particular example. Now strong and bi-directional genotype phenotype correlation is rare in brain disorders. And that just means that you have the genotype, the SCN2A, you have a mutation. The phenotype means physically what happens. So when you have a loss of function, it's been found that that contributes to autism and intellectual disability. However, if you have a different type of mutation and you have a gain in function, the phenotype is that it contributes to early onset epilepsy. So this kind of, they call it bidirectional, and it's very strong because if you have a loss in function, you have one completely different aspect of life, intellectual disability or autism. Whereas if you have a gain in function, it can contribute to early onset epilepsy. And this is also where you get involved in autism comorbidities. So a child can have autism and then can also have epilepsy. So this is where autism can get really fuzzy really quick if you don't stay up to date on the current scientific information that's coming out. Now, the most important thing that has been found about this sodium channel function and sodium channel function in general is you can enhance it or suppress the function of sodium channel. And that's done with drugs. You can also do this with other environmental factors. So this is where the whole belief that your life is dictated by your genetics is completely false. And here's a perfect example. I mean, many people think intellectual disability, if my child has intellectual disability, nothing can be done. And that's not necessarily the case. So if your child does have a mutation for a loss of function for SCN2A, and they are displaying intellectual disability, that doesn't necessarily mean that their life will always have to experience intellectual disability. It's not the case. So pharmaceutical companies can develop drugs to influence the sodium channel function. Other things, other environmental factors can do the same as well. So what good is genetics? It's estimated that about a thousand genes are involved in autism, which means that no one gene is likely to explain more than 1% of cases. And this is the most important part that I hope you've learned from this video is genetics is complex. Yes, that's true. But life is not necessarily dictated by genetics. So if you go and have your DNA screened and you see mutations and deletions and do not get concerned that this is how life is going to be that, Oh, you have this deletion. Oh, you have this mutation. There's nothing can be done. That is so completely false. So the best first step in healing the body is starting the right special diet for your child with autism. It's absolutely the best first step. Hopefully you liked this video. If you did, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any questions, you can certainly post them in the comment section below and certainly subscribe if you want to get my videos delivered to you as soon as I post them. And of course, here are some references.